Segan Holmes, case number 12 CR 1522. The record should reflect that Mr. Holmes is present with his attorneys and the prosecutors are present as well. Are the parties ready for the jury, Mr. Brockler? Just in terms of uh, getting some logistics squared away, there's about 45 minutes remaining on this particular video clip. It'd be my intention after that to do what I did after the first and ask some questions about content from Dr. Reed. Would the court be anticipating going right into the next clip after that or breaking at that point in the afternoon? How long do you think your questions will be? Three hours. No, I'm kidding. I, uh, probably no more than 15 minutes or so. I, I think it might make sense to just take more frequent, shorter breaks than um, longer breaks um, in, uh, that are less frequent. So why don't we take a break at the end of your questions. We'll take a short break and then uh, uh, we can play the next segment. How long is the next segment? Just one moment. About two and a half hours. I, I think um, we should take a, a break after about an hour. We'll take a short 10-minute break. We'll play maybe another hour, take another short 10-minute break, and then play the rest of it, and then have you go into further questions. If we have that much time this afternoon, we probably will run out of time. So we'll just plan on taking a break, a short break, about every hour or so. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Mr. King, are you ready for the jury? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's bring the jury in, please. Please be seated, everyone. The record should reflect that the jury has joined us again. Welcome back, folks. I hope it was a good lunch. Good. I'm glad. All right. Uh, the prosecution may proceed at this time with publishing People's Exhibit P-TR-1004. And I'm going to dim the lights. Lacking. 
Can you give me an example? Um, I just would like lie on the couch and not do anything. Do you play video games just as much or less? Uh, more, I think. More? Okay. Any change in the video games that you played when you were so depressed? Why 
would someone describe you then as extremely bright? Uh, I work hard. Study. Do not. Would they be mistaken? Nope. Would you have fooled them into thinking you were extremely bright? No, I try and be more modest than that. say that a person with a 4 average in high school and even better, a 3.9, whatever you said to the third decimal, <laughs> uh, in, in college, in a pretty tough college course, would you say that takes an extremely bright person? Just one second. Instead of being like angry at broccoli and like chopping it up. 
up or something. Reminds me of the Saturday Night Live skit about chopping broccoli. But you never. Oh, I never saw that. Do you remember that? that? Okay. No. Um, but how does that translate to a feeling about mankind? The uh, hatred. I think it's just because I'm different. I felt, felt hatred towards mankind. Am I quite following you? Uh, I guess I figured I was kind of separate from mankind. So it, it felt different. from I feel separate from mankind to I hate mankind. Um, well, again, it's more of being diverse to mankind, kind of wanting to be alone, uh, solitary. I'm thinking, again, but just my thought. I hate being with mankind. or is that not close to what you want? That's pretty close, yeah. Because they make me feel uncomfortable. When I think of somebody making me or us feel uncomfortable, one of the things might well be, I hate being around them, I don't like being someplace where I'm uncomfortable. something to get to me, to make me uncomfortable. Does that make sense at all? Uh, yes. I'm not sure which one it would be. Okay. And again, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. Next phrase, very self-centered. Uh, I'd say it's accurate. Tell me more about that. What do you think of that? Um, I kind of view the world through my own eyes as opposed to other people's. Tell me more about how James Holmes was very self-centered. Or is very self-centered for that one. All that work I put into studying and learning, that was also self-centered. It's self-centered to put work into study. Because you're kind of uh, gaining knowledge for yourself, improving yourself. Okay. What did you plan to do with the knowledge? Uh, get a good paying job. Okay. Was there any other purpose in the knowledge? Why else did you want that knowledge? Uh, I wanted to see why I was different. to see why you were different. Talk more about that, would you? Um, well, I was interested in the differences between like normal people and people who are different. You had a little pause before you said people are different. I wanted to see the differences between normal people and people who are uh, can, outside the norm, I guess. Can you be more specific as you apply it to yourself in college, high school? <coughs> people who are I guess mentally ill and
Did you view yourself as mentally ill? Or think you might be mentally ill? Uh, sometimes. In what way? In the social awkwardness. Okay. In the intrusive thoughts. Social awkwardness we've talked quite a bit about so far. How about the intrusive thoughts? Which intrusive thoughts? On the violent ones. Okay. Any intrusive thoughts that you haven't mentioned? The saw, the nuclear winter? What else? Uh, ultimately the guns. What were the intrusive thoughts about the guns? Choose as many people as possible. How do you feel as you tell me that your voice dropped just a little bit? Uh, not good. Make you nervous to talk about it, or, or uh, what's, the yeah, what's the feeling? Makes me nervous. Okay. I appreciate your talking. secret between you and I, but I'd like very much to understand them more, and you're the key to helping me understand them more. Okay. Appreciate that. Um, how early in your life were you thinking that you were mentally ill? Um, late middle school. And I'm seeing a difference between a difference between a kid thinking those things and a kid thinking I'm mentally ill. It's still I like, kind of wanted to find the reasons why those things were uh, happening. And the phrase mentally ill came up late like middle school, was it? No, I thought the phrase that I would use was like broken brain. Broken brain, okay. Inside you, as far as you recall? Yeah. Wasn't something you heard on the radio, heard on TV or something? No. Because it's not an uncommon phrase. It's got alliteration in it. It does. It has alliteration in it. It's not an uncommon phrase in conversations about mental illness, certain kinds of mental illness. Okay. Late middle school. What's it like for a, a kid 14 years old? wonder if his brain is broken, or to think that his brain might be broken. Well, I'd want to know as much as possible, so I do a bunch of searches on, like, uh, on the brain and how the brain works. At the time, if you remember, were you pretty sure it could be fixed, or couldn't be fixed, or you didn't know? I didn't know if it could be fixed or not. in that 14 year old's mind of a broken brain. That uh, normal people's brains work their way and my brain works my way. Do you remember any actual picture in your mind of a brain that was broken or something like that? No, there was an like an image of it. So what did you do? which would kind of be related to that. So that's like one of the reasons I went into neuroscience. One of the reasons? Yeah. What were some of the other reasons? Uh, well, there's nothing more important than the brain in my daily life, I guess. years and years and years and years for a 14-year-old. Yeah, I think it had. 
was there was there any way to help you or to make you feel better when you were 14? Um, no, I would do escapist stuff like video games. That helped? Uh, yeah. How much did it help? Did it make it all go away? It made it go away for the time being. Were there other things that made it go away pretty well? Besides video games? Uh, schoolwork, sports. Sports, schoolwork. Anything else? Uh, Basically, any entertainment. Lots of kids, boys and girls, that age, think there's something wrong with them. It's an endemic condition of young teenagers that there's something terribly wrong with them. Right. Um, you, and, and they all take it seriously too. Sounds like very, very serious. Yeah. Do you recall knowing whether other kids said things that made them anxious or nervous or depressed or made them feel awkward too? No, I didn't, I didn't know their names. Do you think you were the only kid that was feeling this? No, I'm sure there were others. At the time? Yeah, I'm sure there were others then too. Okay. Did you ever talk with friends about it? Uh, no, I kept it private. Then how did you know that other kids felt the same thing? Or felt something similar, something akin? Uh, but statistically, there's going to be aberrations. At age 14, you're thinking this, or you're thinking back now? Uh, at 14. Okay. So I guess extremely bright does apply. Maybe. If you're Maybe. thinking that at age 14. science grad school. What does that mean? Yes. And I'll tell you exactly what it means. As I looked at the applications and the comments from the various admissions committees, a number of the people that you interviewed with and who had reviewed your records said you were a good bet for admitting to their grad school. Okay. okay. Agree, disagree, comment? Situation. 
you think you know about AI? You think so? Any particular kind of person or topic or question that might have been more likely to make you freeze than others? Just when it was open-ended, when you know it wasn't a specific topic. Okay. Issues from that it's kind of like didn't know what to say. Disdainful of others. Um, I, I would say, like, in my mind, but not outwardly. So, in your mind, tell me about disdain for others. Well, that kind of goes back to the hatred of mankind. I just didn't see a purpose for people living, I guess. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't see a purpose for people living. Can you expand on that a bit? Not really. How about for you, Lily? Uh, my purpose was to fix myself, I guess. see a purpose for people living. What purpose might you have seen if it had been there? What, what purpose might you have been looking for that you didn't find? Uh, raising a family. Living a cookie cutter life kind of thing. of disdain or not things of disdain? Those were purposes of other people's lives. That would make them worth living or not worth living? I'm not sure. That would make them uh, have a worth living. Okay. Having a family, raising a family. Okay. The disdainfulness, you, you said, Inside, but not. Can I run an outwardly aggressive for any way or anything like that? Aggressive is a little different from disdainful. Why did you say aggressive, not outwardly aggressive? Um, because I'm more passive than aggressive. Okay. A few folks describe you as flat or without affect. Yeah, I can see that too. Those are kind of psychiatric, psychological words. What, what do they mean to you? Flat, without it. Uh, just not showing too much emotion okay. or too responsive to stimuli. As you and I are talking together, I see you smile from time to time. I see you chuckle from time to time. Yeah, I'm not a robot, so. Is that different from the way you were, say, in grad school? No, I'd say pretty much the way I am now is the way I've been. Pretty much the way you are. Avoiding tough personal questions or personal answers. I don't know what that means. By a personal... Okay. I'm asking you a lot of personal questions, some oh, very personal questions. Do you see yourself kind of avoiding those? Or avoiding the answers to them? Um, no, I try and respond to them. Okay. Figure them out. I just say believe it or not. What? Did you say believe it no, or not? I, <laughs> or did I misunderstand you? I might have misunderstood you. Uh, You do often answer with pretty short answers. Yeah, very concise. Could it also be taken as avoiding expanding on the answers and avoiding detail, avoiding detail of the answers? Um, Which, by the way, is the way I take it a lot of the time. I don't know if that's just a speech pattern. Thing. 
there's stuff going on in there. And sometimes it's hard for you to bring it up. Your phrase freezing. That's a pretty illustrative phrase. It, it, that seems a pretty descriptive phrase. Is there more going on in there than is able to come out sometimes? Uh, sometimes, yeah. As you and I are talking, does that, does that get in the way a lot? I would say so. That's why I'm brief.
kind of punching the eye of another figure. And it was supposed to be me who was the one getting punched because she'd forgotten my last name. So when I went to the pharmacy to get uh, my She wrote the wrong name on the prescription. Yeah. Yeah. Um, was it the next visit that the door was locked? Yeah, it was the next visit after it. Okay. And had you sent her the emoticon? When did you send her the emoticon in that context, if you remember? It was in the title. I'm sorry? It was the title of an email. So was the order of events... She wrote the prescription in the wrong name. Yeah. You found out when you got to the pharmacist. It was corrected. You sent her the email with so the emoticon. I, yeah, with the emoticon title and the wrong name prescription attachment. Okay. And then the next visit. She locked me out. She locked, the door was locked. Okay. And your view of the reason for the door being locked was she, she was, thought I was going to punch her. She thought you were going to punch her. And when you say frightened, was she thought you were going to punch her? Did you, did you think she thought anything else? Did you want to do anything else? Um, no, I, I think she misunderstood. Okay. Did she explain anything about the locked door at the time? No, I didn't ask her either. Looking back, do you still think that's the reason that the door was locked, or do you think there was some other reason the door was locked? Well, that was the only time the door was locked. So. Okay. What about the bag or the package or whatever it was? I, I wasn't there. I didn't see it. Uh, that was the only time she carried a bag and put it behind her seat. So I thought it might be like a taser or something. Do you know what it turned out to be? Did you ask her about it? Or no? Um, no, I did. I mentioned the bag, right? And then she didn't say anything about it. She didn't show you what was in the bag? Or? No. Do you think there might have been a taser in the bag, looking back on it? Uh, might have been, yeah. Did you think more surely, or more nearly surely, that there was perhaps a taser or a weapon in the bag then than now? Or do you think now about the same as you thought about it then? I think it was probably just like a birthday gift she received. Some sort of gift. gift bag. There's another thing that you, that you noticed with, with Dr. Feinstein. And let me see if you remember it. See if you can the same thing that I'm thinking of, of course. you remember anything uh, unusual about Feinstein or Feinstein? I don't know how to do I don't know. Um, um, no, I don't recall anything strange. Just something about his hand or arm being wrapped or no, his, his, his arm was in a uh, sling. Okay. What did you make of that? I didn't know if it was feigned weakness or, or not. Feigned weakness? Yeah. Why might he have feigned weakness? Um, I don't know why now. At the time, uh, and I'm really, if, if you recall, you may not remember, uh, and the memory may not be accurate for that matter, but at the time, what do you remember about I thought he might have been hiding something in there. Such as? Uh, like a knife or something. I don't think why might he have a knife in there? I don't know. Speculate. Um, so he could be in control of the session. for them to be 
concerned about you? Or were they misunderstanding? Assuming I don't think I made it clear enough that I was mentally ill. Or if I did it all, I don't know. Well, was there, and, and your view is that you believe they were frightened of you? Oh, at the end, yeah. I thought they were frightened. Was there, looking back now, was that logical? They had reason to be frightened of you, or not? I'd say that's logical, because they already started getting weapons. And then I started thinking they were going to be frightened of me after I got the weapons. You had already started what? Had already started getting weapons. Getting weapons. Did you tell them that you'd started getting weapons? No. And how would they have known that you'd been getting weapons? Um, I don't know. I just thought they would be afraid. Stop for this afternoon. Okay. Um, any questions for me before I leave for the evening? I'll come back about nine o'clock if that's all right with you. That sounds fine. Okay. Any questions about today or that you've thought of the stuff you think I should know? Uh, nope. Okay. All right. Thank you, sir. I hope you have a good dinner. And we'll try to keep the juice flowing. Turn the lights back on. All right, the record should reflect that um, the prosecution just finished playing uh, the last segment, uh, or one segment, I should say, of the uh, exhibit that, that the prosecution has been playing, P DR 1004. Mr. Proctor? Do you want to ask Dr. Reed some additional questions? Oh, yeah, yes, Your Honor. I was just sort of enjoying the absence of the sound of air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dr. Reed, I remind you that you're still under oath. All right. And Mr. Brockler, you may resume your direct examination of Dr. Reed. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, we just finished this second segment, which represented the afternoon of July the 30th, 2014. Is that accurate? Yes. Now, you sat here and you listened to this with us again. Um, I want to ask you a few questions about some of the things that you did, some of the things that we observed, okay? Sure. There's a portion, and it comes in rather late, where you ask the defendant specifically about his affect or presentation in terms of his sense of humor and how he sort of delivers it. Do you remember that? I'm trying to think exactly which part. If you're referring to the part in which I'm telling him one of the things someone has said about him is that he has a flat affect, and that gets us into such a discussion that I do recall that, sure. And let me help you with some of the specific words. As you and I are talking together, I see you smile from time to time. Okay. I see you chuckle from time to time. He agrees. You ask, is that different from the way you were, say, in grad school? No, I'd say pretty much the way I am now is the way I've been. Do you remember that? I recall, yes. Now, in addition to those statements, in your review of all the discovery, the reports, the conversations that you've had with people, do you find that to be consistent as well, that he has presented in this way throughout? It's a little more complicated than that, but generally so. That is, um, he related and people at the university related that he was able to uh, present in class fairly well, not, not super well, and sometimes poorly. But as you heard him say, when the focus was not on him, it was much easier for him to participate or, or to be there or even to make a presentation. Um, I've also, uh, tell me if this is responsive, it may not be, uh, talked within the last few hours with Detective Apple, uh, whom- Objection, Judge. Sustained. Okay. 
Let me ask you this. What we've seen so far in terms of the range of affect and, and emotion, is that consistent with what we're going to see throughout the next 22 hours? Yes. Here's why I ask. Um, you had told us yesterday that you had the chance to review a billion different things, including the reports of the defense experts. Do you remember that? Yes. All right. And one of these is the defense psychiatrist, Dr. Gurr. Yes. Did you have the opportunity to review Dr. Gurr's report about her time spent? Yes, I have. There is a specific portion in here that I'm going to ask if you recall where she's questioning him and she says, his body was shaking and his face was grimacing as though he was crying. Do you recall that? Yes, I do. It stood out. Why did it stand out? Because it was quite, that's quite different from any description of my experience with Mr. Holmes and it's quite different from any experience that I'm aware of that anyone else has had with him uh, as reflected in the record or my interviews or other people's interviews. Thank you. Now, there's uh, some specific things you got into with the defendant, and I want to know if you could tell us what the importance was and what significance it had to you, ultimately, your, your opinions in this sure. case. One was early on, you begin to ask him about uh, faith or religion. Why? Um, excuse me, I'll adjust my hearing aids a little bit. It's the air conditioning, isn't it? <laughs> um, one thing is it's part of the thoroughness. Um, faith for some people is a big part of their lives. Uh, sometimes it changes from childhood to adulthood, things like that. So it's a, it's a part, or maybe a, a part of the exam and a part of him. Uh, another is that among the various reasons or, or things surrounding the shootings, and preparation for the shooting would be the possibility that he felt that it was something that God wanted him to do or God was telling him to do or this was a mission of faith or something like that and I was curious about that. Um, those are the two things that come to mind right now. And by the way ultimately as you go through the rest of this do you ever discover any statements by the defendant that suggests to you that he was compelled by God or doing this on behalf of God, anything like that? None at all in my experience with him. You also talked to him at some point about this concept that he freezes when he gets into these positions that inflame sort of this social anxiety. And, there were, and then he starts talking about the introduction of saws and picturing people's heads lopped off and limbs. Tell us what's significant, if, if at all, about that. Sure, and, and I may talk a little more about that, if I may, because I think it's important that it be understood uh, in context and in the context of a, of a psychiatrist uh, talking about it. Um, the idea, first of all, picture as he has described, a person who does not tolerate well being in even mild confrontation with people or being put on the spot, to use Mr. Holmes' Uh, a phrase. He is very anxious, or he tells me he's very anxious, and I believe that. There are two general ways people deal with being anxious or afraid. They either fight or they run away. Uh, he talked about freezing, um, which is a kind of a different way of dealing with it. The things that he described as images that came to his mind are unusual things to hear from an adult, but they're not unusual things to be in a person's mind. For example, we see things like that in little children who have fear about their anger, fear that they will lose control, fear that their anger can do terrible things. And those folks with small children see that in the, frequently. As we mature and our minds mature, the same kinds of issues are still deep down in our psyches. We still have fears about the power of our anger and the power of our, our different emotions, but we take care of those fears automatically. We're not even aware that we do it. In the situation with Mr. Holmes, that primitive, if I can use the word, that primitive or, or almost infantile, childlike way of dealing with something with his anger is close to the surface and he's conscious of it. This is in part an inference of mine. I don't mean to say that I can read his mind, 
but it's a pretty well-known concept in psychodynamic psychiatry. Regular folks like those of us in most of most of us in the room would not be aware as that happens, and we wouldn't know why if it did. Mr. Holmes is aware, at least part of the time, as that happens, viewing the saws, cutting off a head, and as you recall, he says, the saw is not mine, it's just a saw. He disassociates it from himself. Doesn't, and one may infer, doesn't say that's me talking, that's the saw talking. In my view, this is not a lie, this is the way he perceives it, because it's extremely uncomfortable intolerable perhaps for him to see this powerful anger inside himself. Judge, may we approach? Yes. Mr. Brockler, you may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, uh, we've been talking about this issue of the social anxiety, the freezing, the saw, that um, visualization, I guess, that the, that the defendant engaged in. Um, what I want to ask you Objection, is... Objection, Judge, to the mischaracterization by Mr. Brockler. Um, he's testifying. That's facts, not in evidence. Um, no, he said what we've been talking about. Um, so this is Mr. Brockler's recollection of what he and Dr. Reed have been talking about. All right, go ahead. Just to be clear, because I don't want to mislead anybody, did I say that wrong about what we've been talking about? Um, it was a general statement. I don't think it was a quote. I sort of don't know. I'll, I'll stay out of that discussion. <laughs> He's a smart guy. Um, whatever it was we were talking about, <laughs> that did that have an impact on your opinion about whether the defendant had the capacity to appreciate uh, right and wrong based on the standard that the court has given? It has an impact in that it's, these are things that are beginning uh, to help me think about whether he can control himself, uh, whether he is capable uh, of knowing and doing things, the kinds of things that we talked about is related to what the statute requires. Um, it does not say specifically, but we're getting into an area in which it's evident to me that there's significant mental illness going on, uh, at least as described by Mr. Holmes uh, in him. Let's talk about that for a moment. By the and, way. and once again, if I can just say for clarification so nobody misunderstands, it is not the fantasies in that image that are the mental illness thing. It's the fact that those kinds of fantasies that are truly within all of us, in him they are conscious. In the rest of us, it would take a long time in psychoanalysis to help you realize that you have them. Um, Along those lines, you also asked him about um, a statement that he put in the notebook, and that was about his, the hatred of mankind. Do you remember that? Yes. Why did you ask him about that? It was important in a lot of, in a lot of ways, 
Many people who talked with him discussed one of the motivations for the shootings being hatred or, or anger, hatred towards folks. It was very important to me to know what he meant by the hatred. And he corrected me and said that hatred has more to do with an aversion to mankind than to some violent wish for mankind. And I jotted down here, if I might. I don't see it right away, so I won't take the time. Um, an aversion for mankind, not an anger at mankind. That's the way he was describing it then, and he corrected my impression at the time. Based on what you've been going through with him here on this video, do you um, find that there is a certain guardedness about him regarding anger? The guardedness, that I, the answer is yes. And the guardedness that I see, I want to hasten to say, from my perspective, has to do with a guarding against things that are inside him, protecting himself from seeing, whether by describing to someone else or by thinking about it, from seeing what's inside him. I don't see it as a particular guardedness to keep me from seeing something that might help the prosecution or not help the defense. Once again, I can't read his mind, but my impression was it was a psychological guardedness, not a legalistic one. And these are the things, do they impact other, in your opinion, will they impact the way he characterizes other things moving throughout the rest of this time that you interview him? These are themes that we will see in various contexts in the other interviews, yes. One of the things I wanted to ask you about, because we're going to get to two terms here, specific terms that he used in this, in this interview, and that is, um, do you consider when you're interviewing a person whether they've had the ability to access all the reports and discovery and mental health evaluations by their psychiatrist, all that stuff, does that have an impact or a potential impact on the person you're assessing? I certainly consider uh, whether someone has access to these things and whether they may use them to shade the interview or to malinger or um, to make me think, think certain things. I consider that sure. Here's the two terms I want to ask you about. He uses the phrase intrusive thoughts. That seems like a pretty specific psychiatric term, is it? It's a pretty specific term. It's also a fairly common one. Uh, we see it in psychological context in a lot of different places besides textbooks and in newspaper magazine articles. The other thing is, of course, he's a neuroscience major, and he has done a lot of, of research about his own thinking and about his own concerns. So I ask him, I'm not sure this particular term, but I often ask him where he got certain terms. It's not unusual to me that he knows about and would use that particular term. Two last things. One, you ask him about uh, his girlfriend and the fact that he was, by his statement, uh, in essence, a virgin before he had been with her. What's the significance of that? There's mild significance uh, in that most young men have romantic interests, maybe intimate relationships before the age at which he did. Um, the things he describes doing with his girlfriend, including the, the number of times that they had sex in various weeks, um, is generally closer to that of a person who is not suffering from a major mental illness or deep depression, for example, uh, than one who is not suffering from a major mental illness or a very deep depression. And is it your understanding from your review of everything and your discussions with the defendant that this first of its kind relationship with the defendant occurs in the spring of 2012? Yes. That's during the same period that he appears to tell you that he has had mononucleosis and is feeling his terms depressed. Do you remember that? Objection. Misstatement of the evidence. Uh, the objection is overruled, but uh, the jury will rely on its recollection of the videotape. Mr. Brockler is asking questions, and to the extent that his questions include things that he believes are on the videotape, you need to rely on your own memory of what's on the videotape. The objection is overruled with that cautionary instruction. Go ahead. Governor, sir, do you recall during this segment the defendant indicating to you that he was depressed? Yes. During this period of time that we've been discussing? 
during the spring of 2012, starting during or shortly after the time he had mononucleosis, which was December, January, February, if one looks at the general course of mononucleosis. What's, what's the significance of that area that you spoke to him about? The, I'm not sure I understand the question. For purposes of this, uh, we talked about some diagnostic criteria. We've talked about opinions about capacity. When you start to discuss with him and he talks to you about his depression, what, what's the significance of that as you begin to formulate where you're going with these interviews? It does not generally support an idea that he was not capable of forming intent and, and that kind of thing. Um, he states he was depressed. I asked him to describe the symptoms. They weren't particularly consistent with depression, um, with severe depression. And there's a difference between being depressed. Lots of people get depressed lots of times. But the kind of depression that I'm concerned about is something called major depressive disorder, which is a disabling kind of depression. Um, it's confusing to me. Uh, the general symptoms of mono, which are tiredness and not doing much, uh, overlap with and are a little confusing to me with the, the symptoms of significant depression. I'm not sure that's responsive to you. One of the things that you had asked him about during that conversation was, was he still going to class every day? Do you remember that? Yes, sure. I asked him if he was, yes. What was the purpose of that? I wanted to see how apparently disabling or incapacitating the depression that he was describing was in terms of what, how he was functioning, what he was really doing from day to day and week to week. Did you find other evidence in the record that spoke to that same level or impact of the depression he described? Yes, as far as I can tell from the record, he was going to class. Uh, his grades were uh, good, even a little bit better during the spring semester, although as he points out, the spring semester class-wise has fewer classes and more labs. I'm not sure whether that's more difficult or less difficult than the, than the fall semester, but it's probably still hard. He was going to the fitness center um, in January and February, a little more than once a week in March, April, May, June, um, or March, April, May, June, yeah, um, about twice a week. Um, there was no indication that I know of that he wasn't carrying on his usual life with his friends, life with his schooling, et cetera, uh, during the months from, give or take, February to June. You, the final thing that I want to ask you about on this segment is you had had a discussion with him about his perceptions of um, the FBI. Do you recall that? Yes. Tell us about that. He had said that well, at one point, I thought that the seeing of an FBI vehicle near the shooting range, Byers, uh, Byers Canyon shooting range, was likely uh, imaginary, that is, de perhaps delusional. Um, he was pretty clear in saying, no, I saw the car and it had a big F or the SUV and it said FBI on the side, um, if, if that's what you're talking about. He also was talking about wondering if he was under surveillance at various points, uh, particularly uh, closer to the shootings. Uh, and when I asked him why would he think that or in what context that was, he said, and I may not be using the exact words, he said, uh, after all, I was planning a crime or something like that. First off, tell me, does, doesn't that description instantly mean the defendant was paranoid? He may or may not be. It doesn't tell me he wasn't paranoid, doesn't tell me he was, but it's a logical explanation for those thoughts. Now, many people who are paranoid have logical sounding explanations for their thoughts. Perhaps the bottom line is, um, I'm not sure. Doctor, one other thing that might, exp I'm asking for a hypothetical. Hypothetically, could a person who is plotting a mass murder, and planning to build bombs and set them off in their apartment, that they would be, they would have a heightened sense of someone might discover what I'm doing? Objection calls for speculation, lack of foundation. Overrule? Go ahead, sir. In that hypothetical, certainly, and, and one would expect some kind of caution and suspiciousness about 
what was going on. Now, that may be outside my psychiatric expertise, but it seems common sense to me. Does that um, discussion, though, about thinking the FBI may be surveilling him and, uh, and the possibility that he, um, it, because he's planning a crime, does that have an impact on your assessment of whether or not the defendant had the capacity to know right from wrong under the standards that the court has given? It doesn't have an impact, uh, no it doesn't, in terms of leaning toward incapacity. It suggests that he knew that he was doing something wrong or planning something wrong. And that talks to the capacity to know that? I believe so. Your Honor, may I approach the witness? You may. Sir, I'm handing you what's been marked as People's Exhibit 1005. Do you uh, recognize that? Yes, this is a DVD uh, of redacted video that I looked at uh, in my office a few days ago and initialed as um, the representative of what I was doing uh, during my interviews on that particular day. I'm sorry. Uh, July 31st, the morning session. And that's what I was going to ask. Is this the segment that then takes place the next day after the last session that we just watched? That's correct, July 31st, 2014. Based on your review of that video, is there any chance we don't have the air conditioning sound on it? Uh, boy, I, I, uh, the air conditioner will come on and off, and, and the one thing that uh, there's a, a drinking fountain behind us. When it comes on, it's, it's terrible. Um, the videographer was trying to adjust the sound on the spot, um, and I understand that we're trying to, to refine the sound, not to change the video, but to refine the sound a bit. Um, that's best I can do. Uh, Your Honor, I'm going to move for the admission of People's Exhibit 1005 into evidence, and after the court takes its break, ask to publish. Mr. King, any objection to the admission of P-TR-1005? No additional objections, no. All right, thank you. Based on my prior rulings, P-TR-1005 is admitted and may be published after the break. Members of the jury, uh, let's go ahead and take an afternoon break. Um, rather than just take one afternoon break today, we're going to take a couple of afternoon breaks, maybe three afternoon breaks. Uh, so what I'm going to do is keep them shorter, but I have more frequent breaks, all right? Okay, uh, so let's take our first. Please keep in mind all my advisements during the break, and I'll see you back here in 10, 10 or 15 minutes. That gives you enough time. I know there's a lot of you, so 10 to 15, okay? Thank you. The record should reflect the jury has exited the courtroom. Everyone may be seated. Let's go on break uh, for 10 or 15, and then uh, we'll proceed at that point, all right? All right, the court will be in recess.